book? Can you recommend us books about that? Uh, they're not so much. They're, yeah, that's always the most difficult answer to give. There's something in, the, in one of my books, mm -hmm. and you can find it on the, on the library. Okay. So, that's one thing. Yeah. Okay. And we're working on a new book on controlling in high-rise, and finding new examples, and how does it work. <coughs> because it's a very important question, eh? because <coughs> there are a lot of complex buildings, for instance, former office buildings mm -hmm. in the inner city, we want to change into a living environment, also for families and which are now emphasizing basic needs, but you can also look at specific groups. For instance, for myself, children are the most important group of users. How do they perceive those different zones? How do they act over there? Mm -hmm. okay. So you have to know this knowledge to transfer those buildings. <coughs> yeah, I was wondering about uh, an example of the company that you gave, and yeah. like, if you, com if you uh, compare that to, for instance, gated communities. Where do you think they are laying the difference? Because up to a certain extent, they are, they are also kind of gated communities. Yeah. So True. You can enter. If you enter a compound, there will a lot of people who will recognize you as a visitor. But you can enter. That's, that's a major difference. And they will ask you all the time, Maokamana, where are you going, etc. And then you say, I'm going there, and that's OK. But you will be seen as an intruder, a visitor. The gate community, you cannot enter. And also, the positive thing is, of course, that the built environment can facilitate community building. So in the gate community, again, I like the community, the gate is the problem. If, it's, if the basic incentive is fear, then you have a problem. And what you also see in those American communities, because fear is the incentive, they have to add all kinds of regulations to keep things going. You see now, in those type of communities, there are regulations, for instance, that men and women cannot sport together. Because uh, the interaction between the different sexes can lead to situations uh, where there are all kinds of problems occur. We also know that in Holland, for an, in for an interesting example, by the way, we had an eco-village uh, where these things happened. And then there's a negative incentive, and then the community falls apart. So you need a lot of regulations to work with. But the great thing is, you cannot always predict how it works. That's the great thing. We only facilitate. Yeah. So, so the point is that more, in like for instance, the Kampong Day, you actually uh, kind of create like informal regulations, and like in, in, in uh, gated communities, or like fear is, is all, because I think fear is also a way of controlling your, yeah. like regulations yeah. is a way of controlling yeah. your, well, of course, what's interesting is if the built environment is developing over time, then things are settling better and more easy. The kampong used to be a desa, uh, a, a village. So there's a development over time. And it's difficult to create it at once. That's the bigger task. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. I just wanted to also respond to the earlier question about uh, the books. Maybe an interesting book that uh, you'd like to check out as far as how control mechanisms work. There's a book called City of Courts. City of? City of Courts. Q-U-A-R-T-Z. Okay. That's written by Mike Davis. Mike Davis is a very renowned person who deals with control of the public space. The problem yeah. in Los Angeles. And, and maybe you, you might have already heard this, but another notion is to look on the notion of lived space, which is introduced by Henri Lefebvre, who talks about perceived space, conceived space, and lived space. And, uh, yeah. Thank you. No remarks? I think we should. Uh, I, I have yeah. a small bit. I don't know if it's the right moment to ask, but how, if you, this is all about permanent housing, but how does this translate to, for example, like a setting of a camping site, where you also have, you have a, a day, it's yeah. sort of not a gated community, but by night it becomes really a gated community with, with guards, and during the day everybody does their thing, and in the evening you walk around, everybody's greeting each other, so it's maybe a more ambiguous uh, version of this the same thing. It is. Um funny thing is that it's always part of the, the studies in environmental psychology. How does that work? A very practical example for yourself. How does it work, uh, personal space, uh, go to the library? When it's empty, 
um, and sit right to another, next to another person, he or she won't like it. When it's very crowded, it's normal. So you always find your space related to what other people are doing. So it's very relative in there, indeed. And of course, when it's temporary, you know that somebody is in control in certain to a certain so yeah. Like in the train. Yeah. The train is empty. In your cubicle of four people. Yes. Nobody wants more than two per persons in the cubicle. Yeah. Yeah. So we know how to behave. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.